this year's edition of the um, International Open Access Week with the uh, specific or special focus on um, open for climate change. So this year we have had to put climate change on hold for a couple of minutes due to the late arrival of our first speaker. But without further ado, I would like to introduce the very distinguished Professor Guy Mitchley from the Department of Botany and Zoology. He is also the uh, director for the um, School for Climate Change. He's also worked at the South African National uh, Biodiversity Institute. And um, most recently has also been the recipient of two very prestigious awards. The first one being the, uh, the German um, Humboldt Foundation Research Award for lifetime science contribution. And the other one is the South African Royal Society's, and I hope I pronounce, pronounce this correctly, Marloth, 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 Marloth Medal. And this particular medal is only handed out or awarded to very specific scientists. And I'm going to read this to you. Uh, it's any individual or scientist deemed to have a highly distinguished career. And this is now where the important part comes in. And also have made a significant, significant contribution to advancing this particular individual's field of expertise by writing up on their science, also the service to science, and here's where the, uh, the special part comes in, nurturing young professionals. And I think we're going to hear from a few younger professionals, I'm saying younger professionals, um, after Professor Midgley's um, presentation. And then finally also fostering the public understanding of science, which I think is very important because obviously we're dealing with open access uh, publications and information. So if you can get your research available and in an open access publication for the public to actually view, you can convert them. And um, with Professor Midgley, his profile on Scopus, he actually has almost 45% of his publications are available in open access format, I do believe. <laughs> yes. And also Professor Midgley is one of the top three cited researchers on Go Google Scholar from Stellenbosch University. So I think we are, have really selected a very special presenter for um, this afternoon. Um, I would like to just also mention that after Professor Midgley's presentation, we will also have a few of the younger professionals um, giving their input. Um, they are specifically part of the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate. And uh, South Africa is part of this global alliance. We are the only African institution that is part of this global alliance. I hope I'm still correct with that. And um, the, our institution has 15 of these students from various departments on, um, on campus. So we will listen to what these young or younger professionals have to say and um, how they got involved to the whole um, global challenge to address climate change and other sustainable development goals. So without further ado, over to Professor Medjri. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for that lovely introduction. Uh, can we can I talk pretty well out of mic? Is that, is that okay? Good. Yeah. How, how does it sound? Does it sound all right? Thank you. Okay. Super. Um, yeah, actually, I've just, uh, just got back from a lovely field trip to Yonkers Hook. Uh, uh, we have uh, what's called a flux tower site, which is a fairly advanced piece of instrumentation that measures the basically the, the life force of an ecosystem. So it measures the CO2 absorption and the water vapor loss of an entire ecosystem. And it's probably the, the flux tower in the world in the most diverse ecosystem. So right on our doorstep, <laughs> you can go and visit the most diverse flux tower on the face of this planet. I mean, we, we actually should be taking much more advantage of these things. But uh, but on the way back, uh, I came <laughs> I came past a retired cyclist who'd broken his chain on his bicycle. And I made a mistake of stopping and offering him a lift. <laughs> and that just messed up my entire one here as well. <laughs> But uh, 
um, great. Now, uh, actually, this flux size story is, is quite relevant because there are uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 flux tires in on, on the African continent. Uh, so these, as I said, these systems measure the ability of an ecosystem to absorb carbon, uh, the resilience of that absorption in response to drought and <coughs> heat stress. In the northern, in the global north, there are probably thousands of flux tiles positioned mainly in forests, but also in grasslands and in other northern hemisphere ecosystems. And thus, the, the global carbon policies and the global climate change policies are strongly informed by this information, which is hugely weighted towards northern hemisphere ecosystems. And as a consequence, uh, our negotiators and our policy development relies to a huge extent by information from ecosystems which function in many cases, nothing like our ecosystems do. And so for me, this is a, a real uh, illustration of inequity in certainly in the academic and the science space. And that is tragic. So you know, when we make investments in systems like this, we've got to be very, very careful to make sure that they count. And uh, we, we, we are up against it. I think less than some, quite a bit less than 5% of the world's investment into climate science goes to the whole of Africa. This whole continent gets less than 5%, probably less than 3% of the science investment. So that is, that is the inequity that we, we are talking about. That is, that is a conclusion in the IPCC report that was written by Chris Tresos of UCT, who was one of the African leaders of the Africa chapter. Now, can I, um, oh, I see there's online people as well. Hi, online people. Sorry, I, I hadn't noticed you before. <laughs> um, <laughs> so can I go to, um, uh, I just want to put, I want to share a screen. Uh, just give me a Google. Oh, you, you're there already. Oh, that's fabulous. Okay, so I hope online people and people here, I know people here can see it. Great. Now, I think that the, one of the best ways to talk about uh, inequities is to provide a factual basis from which to operate because you can do a lot of hand waving about what's the best solution for climate change, but we really need to anchor this in, in, a, in a, as, as factual an analysis as we possibly can. So what we have in front of us here is a, a model that has been put together by MIT, <clears throat> another Northern Hemisphere institution. But uh, this, this model, it has taken more than a decade to develop. And what it does is it summarizes on one page, and I think this is the beauty of this little tool. It summarizes on one page the, uh, the global sources of energy, the impacts on, on emissions, and the likely outcome in terms of warming by the end of the century along the top. You'll see those the two graphs and the number along the top. Uh, and for the Americans, it's a 6.4 Fahrenheit. <laughs> um, and then along the bottom, you will see uh, a whole range of um, columns and sliders, little sliders that you can adjust. And you can use this to ask the question, what, uh, how do we achieve equitably uh, a safe climate space, which would be a, a one and a half degrees or, or less, hopefully, <laughs> uh, but certainly less than two degrees by the end of the century. How do we achieve that? What policy options do we follow? And this is a, a general equilibrium model. So in other words, if you make decisions in one, in one area, it, it automatically uh, affects decisions in another area. So for example, if you make a decision about um, natural gas uh, that 
it will affect the price of coal and oil, and therefore decisions you make about coal and oil will then have less of an effect on temperature, right? So, so it takes into account that there are synergies between the decisions that you take. Now, so, the, the, and this is a really great way to start talking about inequities. So how, how do we get safely to a, a, new, a new world, a safe, a safe climate? Now, um, so I'd like to start by saying who's got a favorite intervention? <laughs> There's a bunch. There are energy interventions. There are interventions re relating to transport, buildings, and industry in the middle and economic growth and population growth at the bottom. And then on the right-hand side, there are interventions that we can take relating to land and industry emissions. Deforestation, uh, agriculture, methane, uh, afforestation, and then technological, uh, new tech solutions. And um, what, what we can do is adjust those sliders within the range of a feasible solution and look at how it affects the temperature. So who wants to have a go? And get, uh, I'm going to try your favorite response and see how much of an effect it has on the climate by the end of the century. Who's got a favorite? We can go with oil. So you want to drop oil. <laughs> That's a bad thing. <laughs> Okay, so we'll let's let's uh, completely reduce current government subsidies of oil and um, disincentivize um, oil. Are we, are we, so we'll tax oil consumption. So that's taxing oil to the max, maximum feasible politically. <laughs> It's a bit disappointing, eh? <laughs> well, look at two things. Well, you can look at three things. It, it, it only has a minor effect on the on the temperature by 2100. But if you look at the, the energy, look, look at what happens to energy if you just adjust it. If you just tax oil, what happens? So oil in the left-hand uh, graph is um is is that orangey color a second from the bottom right so we we disincentivize oil you can see how it squeezes out and it's somewhat replaced by a gas and coal so if you just tax oil you incentivize gas and coal extraction so okay all right quite a surprise eh? Uh, I, I love that example. <laughs> Thanks for bringing it up. <laughs> Anybody else want to have a go at a, at a single a single solution? Energy efficiency. Energy efficiency. Great. Let's in transport and buildings. Okay. Let's make buildings and transport much more energy efficient. Pretty good. Pretty good because we have a lot of urbanization going on. Uh, if we invest hugely in energy efficiency, so that would be massive incentivization, well, not massive, but politically feasible incentivization of energy efficiency in our urban uh, spaces and in our transport spaces. We can, that has a very, very significant effect. All right, so that's, a, that, that, that's great. Who, who likes uh, planting a trillion trees? <laughs> Did I work on enough for that? <laughs> <laughs> my favorites. Who likes the idea of planting trillions of trees and tree hugging around the planet? It's been yeah, planting trees into grasses in Africa and destroying people's livelihoods. Okay, afforestation, planting trillions of trees. What does it do? Point one of a degree. Okay, so that's that's not a solution. All right. Um, uh, methane, getting involved in agriculture and, and uh, methane emissions. Not too bad. Yes. W what would you like to try, Vida? It's, a, it's, a, it's an equilibrium model that adjusts 
basically, it, it, well, you can go and look in, if you press on these little dots, you can see the assumptions around each of these interventions. So you can go a little bit deeper, but it's essentially incentivizing or disincentivizing two different means investments in these areas, uh, and they, but also taking into account how those ramify out across the, the entire system. All right, a lot of people like the population growth idea. So let's crunch population growth, okay? And um, that gets us almost nowhere. <laughs> um, in fact, we could even increase population growth and we get a slight increase, but all right. So uh, economic growth as well. I mean, if we just destroy economic growth, um, we can destroy the economy and we will save point, point 0.4 degrees by the end of the century. So, you know, anti-capitalism, maybe not the, the solution that, that many people thought. Um, okay. So what, what what is, there is actually one thing that has a massive effect. And that is if we put a price on carbon, which a, a lot of businesses absolutely hate. South Africa's facing a carbon tax. There are industries in South Africa that are, are railing against it. But if we put a price on carbon, we can seriously start to incentivize responses. So we, we properly build in a tax on carbon that to some extent reflects the true impact of carbon emissions on the environment. We can we can drop we can drop uh, emissions quite fast. So we th this tax, I think uh, the assumption is that the tax goes up to $100 a ton by 2030. Okay, but it, you know it doesn't get us out of the it doesn't get us out of the woods. You know, the, the essential message here is that we have to use a combination of solutions and globally and regionally. And if you can, you know, if you can put, put some kind of a tax on carbon, you can, uh, you can incentivize energy efficiency in transport uh, and um, uh, cities. You can, you can also achieve that through electrification, by the way. So. If we go, if we electrify, depends. It depends on how you incentive. It. So if you electrify, uh, sorry, I'm just playing around here, confusing people. But if you electrify, and then you put a price on carbon, you know, you, you massively incentivize renewable, renewable um, uh, energy. And then it doesn't, it doesn't matter really what you do with coal because coal's been taken out of the equation anyway because you've incentivized renewables, right? So, so that's how you, you get rid of coal, which is what's happening already. Um, and then, you know, energy efficiency still helps a lot. So if you can really get your buildings uh, energy efficient, you, you can generate a lot of savings. That's particularly in the Northern Hemisphere, but also down here. Um, so energy efficiency really helps. And these are things we want to do anyway, because it, it improves people's lives and it creates a whole lot of new jobs. And then, you know, we've got to actually play around. We've got to get uh, deforestation down and we, we've got to involve ourselves in, in, in reducing emissions from, from uh, land use and, and, and methane. So now we're into, we're into the, the 1.8, you know, below two degree. But it's taken a lot of effort. We put a huge tax on carbon. You know, we've had to do that. We've had to hugely increase, you know, we've got to develop a whole lot of new technologies. Uh, afforestation doesn't really help us, so let's just leave that off the table. It's a complete waste of time. Um, uh, time, money, and ecosystem services and destroying people's livelihoods, uh, except in some areas. Um, I mean, this is mainly in, in, in Africa where forests don't belong. Uh, I'm very, very biased about making sure that that message gets across. Uh, and then, but we need tech, you know, we need, uh, we need new technology. So if we can really, uh, invest in new technologies that start to draw carbon out of the atmosphere, then we're starting to really get somewhere below one and a half degrees. And uh, I mean, the issue is that we've painted ourselves into such a corner now that we do, we are now starting to rely on, on, on tech the solutions to, to pull carbon out of the atmosphere. We can't really just do it through using ecosystem-based approaches, um, you know, uh, agricultural efficiencies. And and these and these sorts of incentives, uh, you know, buy energy doesn't make it doesn't really help anymore because we've incentivized everything through the carbon price. So you can substitute the carbon price for incentives, uh, changing incentives in in oil, coal, and bioenergy. Um, 
And interestingly enough, you can you can increase economic growth very significantly and still stay below one and a half by the end of the century. So there, there's no argument here that you've got to chuck economic growth away and uh, you know, condemn the world to, um, to, to no economic growth. It's possible to do with uh, as long as you as we get these tech solutions in place. So um, I think you know once you start playing around with a model like this, and of course not everything is in here. So like I don't, I'm not sure green hydrogen is in here, for example. But um, once you once you're confronted with some very real sets of solutions and their likely success. I think it much better informs the debate about you know, inequality and what, how, we, how we go about achieving it. Because you know, I don't think there's anything like a carbon price for really hitting inefficient industries and, uh, and really rapidly incentivizing those industries. But then we've got to put in place the the solutions that allow those industries to transition and all the workers in those industries to maintain uh, their livelihoods. We can't just make a change like this and uh, allow them to uh, allow, allow that to, to happen and, and, and see people uh, losing their jobs. I mean, if you think about what happened in the US with the, the move away from coal and how that has helped to really polarize politics for example, in, in West Virginia, uh, you know, the, the, there are states in the US that were really severely affected by the move away from coal, and that has affected the outcome of, of, of elections even in the US. So uh, you, you've got some very real, uh, uh, real, uh, you know, real life examples of what might happen. And here in South Africa, you know, how many livelihoods are based on the coal industry and, uh, uh, you know, ESCOM and uh, all those sorts of things. Can we can we flip this economy in a sustainable and an equitable way away from that carbon intensive um, future? And and in addition to that, if South Africa were to do that, would that set in train a series of um, interventions or commitments? Uh, and signals that would signal to the rest of Southern Africa to follow this sort of a path. Already Namibia is negotiating with Germany around a green hydrogen deal, which makes a lot of sense in Namibia. Why does green hydrogen make so much sense in Namibia? Why does it not make it as much sense in South Africa? Well, it makes a lot of sense in Namibia because Namibia has got a very small energy demand. It's got a tiny grid, very small population, not much bigger than, than Greater Cape Town. Um, it's got a lot of renewable energy, and therefore it makes sense for Namibia to use a lot of renewable energy, roll that out, and create hydrogen and sell it on the open market and make money out of it. In South Africa, um, it makes much more sense to generate renewables and just replace the energy from coal. That is a much more efficient trade-off than for us to generate hydrogen and sell it. So, um, you know, Namibia is in a bit of a sweet spot for so, so for green hydrogen. But yeah, so all these trade-offs. So you've got to you've got to think about the economics, you've got to think about the socioeconomic impacts, you've got to think about even the science that supports uh, these sorts of projections. Where is it generated? Is there a bias in it? Do we have the ability to even interrogate that? Uh, who, are, who is Africa training in this space? Africa doesn't even have a regional integrated model to assess the impacts of policy decisions on the African landscape. Uh, we, we have to use uh, models developed in Europe uh, to explore somewhat what goes on in our landscapes. Uh, and Europe has got these brilliant models like image, which are, are able to simulate the impacts of policy responses on, on European landscapes. So, and because we only get 5% of the, of the global science cut, uh, how, how do we compete in that in that market? It's it's very very difficult. Um, I think I think our climate school uh, in in Stellenbosch it, it launched on on three million three point three million rand a year. Uh, a similar climate school was launched uh, in in North America, was Columbia, uh, uh, on on sixty million dollars. <laughs> you know. <laughs> 
that's the sort of it's grotesque. It's grotesque uh, the the inequity that we that we are facing. Um, but anyway, so so I I like to I like to kick off a, a discussion of this kind based out of out of the factual uh, sort of a factual basis and and then to to start to to talk about it. Um, Yancy and Kay were both involved in our work with the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate, and they went through a pilot training process which involved uh, a number of Saturday afternoons. Ten Saturday, twelve Saturday afternoons. I can't remember how many. About ten. About ten Saturday afternoons, where uh, each each uh, member of the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate was offered the opportunity to to present uh, a different element, a different aspect of climate change science or policy or implementation to, to the group. There were, a, a start, I think there were about 150 students to start with selected from all the universities in the Alliance around the world. I think it whittled down to about 120 at the end. And um, so they've been through this training. Uh, at Stellenbosch, we presented a, 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 a set of lectures on adaptation but we engaged in a lot of the other lectures as well. Uh, and so they have been through almost, uh, you know, they were, they were sort of guinea pigs in the first pilot multi-continental training, uh, which, which took perspectives from a wide range of, of angles. And, and they can talk a little bit about their experiences. It would be very, very interesting to hear, uh, particularly about the difficult and edgy discussions that came up because they were asked to work in groups, multi-country groups, uh, to to come up with solutions. So, so I, I really want to let them have a chance to talk about their experiences as well. But um, maybe I can just take a few questions, major questions or uncertainties that that are raising people's minds, and then we can let Jens and Kay uh, have a floor. Yeah. Talk about their experiences. Okay, yeah. good. Um, I've got two questions that came online. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first question is, uh, what to do with carbon once captured? Mm. Let's <laughs> go to <laughs> put it in a bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's such a good question. Um, there's so many. There's so many solutions. Well, what what the world does with once it's captured, ultimately, is you know one of the major sinks for carbon is is marine carbonate. So it ends up at the bottom of the ocean. It's washed down in rivers, ends up at the bottom of the ocean in marine carbonate, and and then gra gradually gets recycled. The top of Mount Everest happens to be marine carbonate. <laughs> Which is <a> so, <laughs> so, but that happens over millennia, and th that's one of the important processes that drives the the um, extraction of the natural extraction of CO2 out of the atmosphere. It might surprise you to know that the action of tree roots is really important in driving this process. So as CO2 rises naturally, it's fertilized, it stimulates the growth of trees in particular, uh, and probably grasses as well, but because this work's done in the northern hemisphere, they haven't looked at grasses enough. Uh, that's up to us. But these, uh, what these plants do is they exude carbon-rich compounds into the soil, and they use that to adjust to soil conditions. They use it to feed bacteria, which in turn scavenge for nutrients and free nutrients up in the soil. So plants are not passive acceptors of the soil environment. Plants really change the soil environment. They have ways of changing it. And uh, they do it by exuding these carbon compounds. And those carbon compounds can leach out in, in soil water and then flow down into the ocean. And that sets up this very long range cycle, which uh, naturally tends to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, uh, the last time this, this process happened and came to an end was about 18,000 years ago. So 18,000 years ago, the, the CO2 concentration of our atmosphere was 180 parts per million, which is uh, less than half of what it is now. Uh, and then it came to an end because the world started to warm naturally. 
and all the sinks that have been built up in the oceans, when the oceans get colder, they absorb more CO2, so they so there's a feedback effect, a positive feedback effect, which causes more cooling. But finally, what happens is that CO2 gets so low, this is one of the main theories, that tree growth becomes severely impaired and the process of root exudation slows down. And so it reaches a floor and you can't go lower. Of course, in Africa, we have grasses that can push a floor. Uh, these C4 grasses, grasses that have got a special photosynthesis that is able to draw all of the atmospheric CO2 uh, out of the atmosphere. And in fact, C4 grasses, if, if they were left by themselves, could, uh, could potentially cause the extinction of trees if they, if, 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 <coughs> if, if they were allowed to. I mean, you can put a C4 grass into a closed chamber and it will draw the CO2 down to zero, essentially. So, um, anyway, so, so that's, that's one way. I mean, we've got ways, basically it gets liquefied and it gets injected into uh, geological structures, which are specially selected to be as safe as possible, or it gets re-injected back into structures from which we have already extracted hydrocarbons. And this is what Norway does. They inject uh, liquid CO2 into, into the, the areas, not necessarily to replace the, the oil that they're extracting, but to get more oil out. So it, it, it displaces the oil and they can extract every last drop. So uh, th those are a couple of ways. Yeah. One more question. <laughs> Um, yeah. What does carbon tax help if we have no means of auditing the carbon emissions as disclosed by uh, your corps? Yeah, well, I mean, the carbon tax will only work if you have the right implementation in place. So without audits, carbon taxes won't work, just like any taxes. But, you know, the, 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 the critical role of a tax is that it gives a thing value. Uh, I mean, the only reason our currency has any value, the, the rand, the only reason our currency has value is because we have to pay taxes in it. If you didn't have to pay taxes, rands would be basically valueless. Um, so as soon as you put a tax on carbon, you give, you give it uh, the value. Essentially, you, know, you could ma make it into a currency. So, uh, so putting a tax on something gives it a value. And that, of course, is coercive because it comes with the government, you know, government implementation of gathering that tax. So if governments are weak in gathering the tax, then it, it, it also loses its value. So, yeah. Good question. And thanks for opening the question of what taxes do. Uh, yes. Breitenbach is full of questions today. Yes. Uh, she's got another one. There's little to no demand for stored slash captured carbon, and it costs a ton to sequestrate and then still cost to store. Sequestrate. Oh sequestrate. Yeah, <laughs> store. Store for, store for the long term. Yeah. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, yeah, different sequestration methods cost different amounts. Uh, so yeah, these high-tech solutions are going to take investments. But that's what stimulates economic growth, stimulates new jobs, stimulates new investments. And uh, it's worthwhile for governments to invest in those things because it creates a better future. It creates a safer future. If we replace coal in this country, we will avoid health problems for literally tens of thousands of South Africans who currently have health problems because of the way we mine and burn coal. Uh, even deaths will be avoided. Uh, early deaths due to due to our burning of coal. So um, it makes sense for governments to to invest their currency <clears throat> in these solutions because they will pay back in the form of uh, you know, new jobs, crea creativity, <clears throat> and enhanced GDP. But a, a form of GDP that is sustainable, sustainable growth, or dematerialized growth, no, carbon free. Thank you. That is all the online questions. Great. I'm sure some more will pop up. But throw some awkward ones at me as well. And I love awkward questions. The more awkward, the better. So I hand over to you guys. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Uh, open questions from you guys. We'll have time. We have audience for a while. Are, audience are okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, 
Will you be using the same site or are you going to go and just um, Okay. Mm -hmm. I need to get you guys on here, but I want to get all this out. In any case, but there you guys are. Okay. <laughs> Is it the stop presenting? Yeah. This one. Okay. Okay. There you go. Thank you. There you go. Okay. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kay Murray. Um, so, like Guy said, uh, Yenti and myself were taking part in a youth training program, an international youth training program, which is one of the world's first that kind of brought um, leading professors from around the world from economics, um, climate change, finance, politics, and biodiversity and agriculture together. And we had these um, wonderful sessions on Saturday, every Saturday afternoon for nearly three hours sometimes. Um, it was hard, but it was very, very enriching. Um, it gave us opportunity to like get out of our academic silo within the sciences and have access to globally, like the forefront of global information um, state of the art information about how we need to tackle climate change from multiple different directions. Um, what's important, the reason that it's important to have young people being trained in this manner is that we all know that there's a large climate youth movement. Um, for example, in Europe, that youth movement has led to the change, the direct change in policy um, or European policy towards climate change um, in certain aspects. But a lot of the time, um, I mean, the importance of this youth activism is the fact that young people do find themselves with more access to interdisciplinary and intercultural ideas. So, for example, bringing the idea of um, decolonialism, decolon decolonizing science, well, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> decolonizing science to to the stage, or um, bringing it into the IPCC, as Yenzi was saying me, to me earlier, is is something that hasn't been done before. Um, in other words, young people kind of cross the disciplinaries a lot easier, unapologetically. unapologetically um, and um, yeah, with treating it with an importance and time that isn't afforded to people in the older generation of climate change science. It's important to have young researchers being trained to deal with this so that we can actually, um, we can support the these kind of interdisciplinary um, arguments um, being made by young people and and kind of police or make sure that um, certain issues are um, addressed in global policy. Um, yeah, I mean, that's that's something that you've spoken to me about quite mm -hmm. often um, in terms of um, the kind of stage or how climate change policy currently, the, the current culture of climate change policy or climate change discussions, you know? Um, yeah, and just my name is Yenzi, and I was also involved in Talk with K. And there was also a number of other students from Stellenbosch that took part in the whole program. Um, they just couldn't be here today, but it was quite a diverse group of people from different faculties as well. And I think, um, as Kay mentioned, how there were different themes that were um, looked at and different professors from different disciplines and professions that were present. The importance of that is more so to make sure that we understand climate change in its entirety, not just about it being about carbon the whole time, but rather there are so many different aspects, as Guy even showed on the inverse thing, so many different aspects from different fields that can contribute into helping us fight climate change. And um, just to also touch on what Kay was talking about in terms of youth involvement and youth engagement within the climate space, um, it's obvious like youth have a lot of energy and they have a lot of foresight into the future of trying to create a future and an environment that's going to be at least pleasant for us to live in. So it's important that these people that are going to be around in the next 50 to 80 years um, know exactly what they're going to be, what they're saying when they go out and protest, when they go out and 
give awareness. What are the youth actually saying? So this program really gave us an opportunity to learn more about what climate change is all about, but also not only to learn about it from our own perspectives, but rather the perspectives of other people. So um, since Stellenbosch was the only African university that was involved in the program, we had like the reality or the experience of us being in the space or in a room rather of people from largely the Northern Hemisphere, yeah. um, who have a very West-centric idea of what climate change is, and their perception and their, how you say, what's the their context, the context yeah. in which they understand climate change is very West-centric. And it was almost a little bit like a goosebump moment to listen to how they consider Africa in terms of climate change, um, or the lack of consideration thereof, I think, is a better yeah. Um, yeah, but it was not just only the students, but also the professors as well. Like it was very Eurocentric and it almost wasn't that enjoyable for us because of the fact that a lot of the things that were talked about, yes, they do have relevance because they, it is a global issue. But some of it you're like, oh, you could have also included this. Like how are we as Africans benefiting from this? Why is this not as relatable to us? And it was so important and such a good thing that Sunbosch was able to be involved in this because from there, we were able to host the African Regional Forum by the School for Climate Studies, in which we had people from all over Africa who came down to Stellenbosch in September. And we had these discussions around environmental justice and climate justice um, and what it means in an African perspective and what it means for us as young scientists, as Africans, what do we want to do with it? And also just creating our own narrative around climate change and the impact that it actually has. And largely, I mean, most of the time that we speak about climate change is always these very technical talks, but a large part of it is actually people. And unfortunately, that is the most difficult aspect to change, like change the way that people think. Um, and because the climate space is very white, male, European, um, it means that there's a lot of information and knowledge that doesn't get filtered down to the average lady sitting at home up in KZN somewhere in the grassland, someone who actually gets affected by the tiniest changes within the climate has ac ac no access to this information. It, it's not relatable to her, although it's highly relevant. So, and, and also doesn't get, that woman doesn't get the ability to, to contribute to these mm. kinds of discussions. Yeah, because of like the culture of the space. Yeah, yeah. So it's these like barriers that have been created, and in, in terms of our understanding and our approach towards climate change, um, that have made it so difficult for people that actually, not well, everyone will be affected, but people that will be that are extremely vulnerable to climate change that haven't been able to contribute um, useful knowledge and also just be able to have to access information around what they can do to make the environment a little bit more of a better place in a way. And I was in a talk, a workshop last week with Guy um, in the forestry department. And one comment that was made was um, that we need to start learning from the poverty of the poor or like using the poverty of the poor as solutions in order for us to be able to approach climate change. And Africa is the poor in this case. And we're so innovative in terms of the ideas that we generate, in terms of the context that we understand not only nature, but the relationship and synergy between nature and people, because we're so highly dependent on it. And we don't have a, a way in which we can express all this knowledge and this vision, these visions that we have and the, what we experience in a changing climate, because we don't have resources, we don't have funding. Um, if anything, we just get thrown to the side. We're more of a, oh, yeah, an afterthought. And it's so unfortunate. Um, so definitely being in this program, I think, has created a greater sense of urgency, not for myself, but I, I think Kay has also shared the same sentiments, but a greater sense of urgency to bring in climate justice and understanding of climate change to a more relatable context, especially for vulnerable people such as women and children, and especially for Africans and what that means for us and, yeah, as us as academics, us as youth and us as females. Um, so yeah, it's been very interesting and thought provoking and oftentimes it grew a bit passionate, but we really enjoyed it, I'd say. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I think from what you're saying there, the most important, um, the, the relationship between what we experience or how that's important for the open access of information is that um, like, like I was saying, there is a combination of different actions that need to be taken globally in order to address climate change. 
Um, and a lot of the time, some of these um, actions or solutions that are proposed are proposed using African resources or using African ecosystems and will have impact on African economies, local lives, and um, yeah, essentially, what's it, uh, the, the what, when your life is good, the, the quality, quality of quality, quality of life. <laughs> Um, so, the, so to to use this as an example, um, I mean, this is important for the open access of information because African countries need to be generating our own information about what is going to be happening on our own soil, and we can't do that without access. We can't do that without access to resources. Um, I was really shocked recently by the movement of one of the big uh, journals towards open access, saying that in order to publish in their journal as an open access um, article, which will re get more citations, which will get more feedback, um, you have to pay a fee of $9,000 or £9,000. I don't think that's very open access. I don't think that's very accessible to anyone in an African institution. Um, but the point is, if we don't have open access, yeah, we can't generate information that's relevant to our own systems. And what this means is, oh, to contextualize guys kind of fervor against afforestation, for example, that is a kind of um, European centric idea that proposes to use African, that um, it was an oversight that kind of a, a very blunderous oversight to say in a recent paper that we can use African grasslands to plant mm. trees in order to sequester carbon. That first of all ignores the fact that we haven't received enough funding to study the ability of um, African grasslands to sequester carbon, but also the impact that a foresting an entire intact ecosystem will have on local communities and local economies. Mm. That's a colonial mentality. It still exists. It's important to talk about it in those terms so that we can address it. Mm. And it's important for young people to have that platform for that reason. So just in terms of what open access can do for young African researchers, it is our bread and butter. We only get, it's 3%, it wasn't it? 3% of the global available funding for climate change research. And we're the, Af the continent that's going to be impacted the worst. How does that make any sense? I don't think it does, but yeah. Yeah, and just touching on the notes as well, understanding climate justice or the, the the term itself for me i always think if i listen to the word justice or think of the word justice i rather think of about freedom and equality and it goes without saying that a world that's going to get warmer and warmer is going to become increasingly more and more unequal and already in africa we bear the brands of being unequal as it is so just imagine with such great temperature increases and all these other natural phenomena that we're going to experience, how much more it's going to grow unequal for Africans. Um, and also just in terms of freedom, climate change is going to cause a lot of displacement. And the people that are going to get displaced are people that are already impoverished, people that are already in vulnerable communities. And largely that's African people. Um, so it really, when we think of climate justice, we should consider all those points in from a humanity perspective, not just an environmental perspective, but from a humanity perspective. Um, and just really, sort of pay, have empathy for what what's going to happen in Africa. Um, and yeah, I think that's what for me personally, my urgency in terms of the climate space is, is about just understanding the role of people and how they're going to be taken away from resources and landscapes that they benefit so much from. And they already don't have as much as it is. And now we're going to increase temperatures. We're going to have more droughts and more flooding events. And then it's just going to be even worse and worse off. Um, yeah. Sorry, that was just like an afterthought. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that was an afterthought. Mm -hmm. I think that's pretty much like the the kind of horror of the, the climate change effects on, on societies in Africa. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, I think we have both grown a lot through this like opportunity mm -hmm. to learn how to engage with the different fields and having access to um, the resources of multiple fields, um, to, to professors from multiple fields, 
it's it could only be provided by universities to be honest um, and institutions like this um, but hopefully we have given you an idea of the importance of having youth voices and the importance of having open access so that we can expand the research that we've that we are capable of doing um, going forward I and we didn't talk too much about it but also just the importance of collaboration like yeah. This has been such an eye-opening experience, being able to collaborate with all these different institutions and realizing that, yo, guys, as Africans, we really, we need, to we really need to collab more <laughs> and make sure that we are heard more, rather, um, because there's definitely a misconception or a misunderstanding of what climate change is in our particular context. And that's fair enough. I mean, we don't publish as much. We're not that prominent as certain Western, um, feel, um, Western institutions. But um, just also in terms of collaboration, also just the transdisciplinarity and just learning from other fields as well and working with other fields, working with um, people within the economic field, within the energy field, um, even within social sciences and seeing how we can foster these relationships where climate change becomes not only just like an issue for the waste or issue for people that actually, well, we all live in the environment, but um, it should be more of a household conversation, like a very sort of domestic conversation, because the little that we do, even as individuals, really does make a huge impact. And um, yeah, just being able to foster collaborations, um, making the space a little bit more inclusive as well, um, and making sure that different contexts are represented can just mean that we can do a lot in terms of making strides towards a better and safer environment for everyone. <laughs> okay. I think, yeah, I think that's about as much as we know to say. <laughs> you talked about uncomfortable conversations in your teens. Mm. Yeah. And maybe you just want to I mean, explain a little bit about that. So, like, I think Yenti touched on it a little bit, the fact that we were talking to people from, like, across the world. Um, and we actually, I don't know, with kind of the Gen Z culture, we expect everyone our, around our age to have um, similar opinions to uh, as us about climate change. We expect people in the climate change spheres from all of these countries to have taken coloniality or colonial mindsets into account and to think about solutions to climate change in a much more interdisciplinary disciplinary manner and a much more humanitarian manner. Mm -hmm. We ended up having conversations during this training that kind of showed that wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. So it's, it was really jarring. It was hard to see people our age proposing solutions to climate change like afforestation mm -hmm. or things like um, uh, international involvement in developing nuclear plants in Africa, which could um, kind of develop a state of debt, um, debt diplomacy like has been created with um, certain like uh, infrastructure projects in Africa already between Africa and China. Um, it was it was really jarring to see those conversations happen between young people. The point is that it was important for African people to be in the room to go, mm -hmm. um, no, you can't do that. <laughs> it's it, that's why young people from multiple different nations, cultures need to be sitting at a table. Um, is generally to make sure that if there is something problematic that comes up, we can address it and talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, two guys. Um, when in these conversations, when you brought up those points uh, from an African perspective, what was the general like, response when people opened up to you and said, "Oh, they're like, absolutely not. Like our science is stronger." What? What? Yeah. What was the experience? I think it's important to also print you know, people going into these spaces and asking people to start having these conversations. What's your experience? Yeah, like, I didn't have too many awful experiences. Oh, okay, repeat it. Okay, so, so the question was, um, what was the experience of us um, actually interacting and then bringing up the African perspective or bringing up what how what 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 was said means for us as Africans, yeah. and what was the experience, or how was it received online? Um, okay, there was this one particular talk that I actually went to where I was like so shocked that wow, people like this are actually real. Like I didn't realize <laughs> they were real, but um, it was more of 
we were thrown, it's either it's an you ignorant, you don't know enough, and um, you would be thrown a lot of like web links to actually go check what you've just said. Like, as a matter of fact, you, you don't know what you're talking about. So there's also that idea of, as Africans, maybe we don't know that mm. much. Um, and that was like very, that was painful because like, yo, bro, <laughs> no. <laughs> but um, so it was, it was that. And I think luckily for the person that was actually involved in this little conclave was she would just remain level-headed and said, okay, well, we can agree to disagree and then like just moved on with the conversation. But I think it, one thing that I also appreciate about Gork was the fact that we had learned about so many different themes and so many different topics that we we felt well we felt a little bit more well versed in being able to answer and engage in that sort of in that sort of discussion. The final talk that we had on the Gork platform was about leadership, was centered around um, climate mm -hmm. leadership, and in it they expressed the different aspects of leadership that we um, should like strive towards or that we can possess as an individual as a climate activist. And one of the um, one of the aspects was to have a, a high knowledge credibility, but also it's to be able to work within a team. And cl approaching climate change is teamwork. And sometimes you are going to deal with difficult people. And more so if you are coming from a perspective or a context that they don't necessarily relate to, you are going to deal with people that are not going to agree with your opinion, and you're often going to be outnumbered. So it's so just I think going forward or as a person that's going into a space where you're going to be representing a minority in this case, to just be well informed, to understand that you are working with a team. And we know how, okay, no, let me not say this because it's going to sound spicy, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's to remain level-headed, to know what you know, be willing to learn from others as well, learn from that engagement on how to deliver maybe what you wanted to say. Um, and also just be confident about where you're coming yeah. from, back yourself up, and we do have a lot of resources, like knowledgeable resources that we can have, we have access to that we can also refer to. So, um, yeah, I think just more, more, more than anything, understand that this is teamwork and you're not going to always agree with people. So if someone doesn't agree with you, don't be hostile about it, but rather approach it as, OK, well, I'm willing to learn from you if you're willing to learn from me. Sometimes it'll work out, sometimes it works, but it's, yeah, I think just remain level headed. Yeah. Yeah. Seems to me you guys first have to give you the voice, you know, yeah. give the African continent, the southern continent a voice before you could give your opinions or you know ideas of you know solutions or start taking part in the yeah. conversation. And yeah. these, so pe like, these people, I mean these people. African con um, context is is often treated like a burden, um, which is also I, I'd say very reflective of, of colonialism. It's like um, or do we have to keep kind of making um, making space for this this thing that doesn't affect any of us? Um, whereas in Africa, it's our entire existence, um, and more for more so for some than for others. And so, yeah, people either don't know about our perspectives and what's important for our context. Or kind of treated, yeah, treated as a as a burden and, and as something that's getting in the way of their progress. Would you say it's sort of like a generational thing, if, if, um, you know, the group that you guys were with? But because, like you say, even some of the, uh, you know, the professors that were there were also watching about. Uh, my my problem is a society thing. It's a societal thing. It's a lack of well. It, Yenzi was saying empathy now, and that's a difficult one for me because how do you make people empathize? You can't. Um, you can you can develop some kind of forefront like like upper level superficial type of of empathy, um, but trying to generate the depth of empathy required for people to understand the African perspective is not necessarily something I know how to do. Um, if someone else has and has been withholding that information, who are you? <laughs> Come out of your cave. Um, yeah. What, what about? Uh you said a word like decolonize. What about a word like counter-colonize? Oh no. <laughs> active, like, let's, well, decolonize you know, is active. It, it is, but it's 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 about it's about removing. What about adding? What about uh, replacing? Replacing the bad with better. I think that's focusing that's, too much on the word. I, I get what you're saying. It's, but it's the, it's the, you know, the sense, 
in Africa that we, you know, we want to, we, we should be coming with, 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 with strength, with, with things to offer. We have so much to offer. Um, yeah, I find, I, I'm trying to reach for a word that more better, better reflects. I think. Better reflects that, you know. Is what you, is what. Than any reactionary. Is what you're saying, for example, if we want to decolonize um, climate change mitigation strategies, for example, instead of saying decolonize climate change mitigation strategies by um, uh, like combating afforestation, instead say our African solution is to um, develop these kind of financial tools to support our own ecosystems. You want a word for that that isn't decolonization. I see that as decolonization. But the yeah. word has become so contentious um, to the extent that institutions in Europe have literally banned students from using it because of lack, fear of lack, um, fear of funders pulling funding um, frequently. Um, yeah, I think more than anything, um, it's just more about owning our narrative more. And like mm. I was saying with the flux towers, there's so many flux towers up in Europe, which means that they have a hoard of information that they use essentially to create global policies that don't necessarily relate to African context because we only have about what 12 in the whole continent, such a huge continent, there's only like 12 flux towers that are recording information for our particular and unique landscapes, but we're being informed by policy that has nothing to do with, mm. with what, the, what Africa is actually experiencing. Yeah. And if decolonization is such a hard word to digest now, it's just a matter of us owning our own narratives by creating more relationships within the African con um, continent, by creating more knowledge and generating our own knowledge, being very active and innovative in the solutions that we come up with and owning it as solutions that are specific for our context. And also just being more, not being afraid to cause a little bit of disruption and saying that, no, okay, I agree with what you're saying. Yes, that's relevant for you. But in the African context, this is how we'd approach it. And oftentimes it is difficult to, be like to be out there and to be um, a little bit more outspoken because of the fact that you're often a minority and because of the regard that society generally has for someone coming from Africa. But um, with also the, there's an African journal for climate studies, on climate studies that was just launched by the School of, um, for Climate Studies, which is basically a journal that's gonna allow Africa, a young African right um, academics and professionals to contribute into the knowledge pool that we have on Africa. And I think just creating that narrative where we have African stories and African ideas and um, pursuits in order to try and mitigate climate change will actually help us to sort of be more taken care of when it comes to policy and governance around mm -hmm. climate change. At least support our negotiations. At least, yeah, support our negotiations. Here's another great example of inequity and it relates to how forests, uh, tropical forests are monitored, or how the world's biomass is monitored using satellites. And you know, we've invested, the world has invested hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, billions of dollars in satellites that can measure biomass from space. Um, but they don't work that well in tropical forests because they look down and they can't see the full, the full uh, picture. Uh, so how do you measure better in tropical forests? Well, you use people to go and climb up trees and measure their diameters and measure the rates at which they're growing. And that costs a few tens of millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. But we've invested billions of dollars in satellites to get these answers a few tens of millions of dollars in actually paying people in tropical countries to come do the measurements. <laughs> if we just switch that around, you could have created these amazing jobs in natural ecosystems and all those tropical countries would have been invested in measuring their own carbon. They would have had a, a much better uh, understanding of, of the resource that they have available. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet we, this is pointed out in the talk that I watched yesterday uh, by uh, by an Oxford University uh, uh, professor called uh, Simon Phillips. Simon, Simon Phillips, no? Anyway, he's, he's, he's done some brilliant work on carbon in the tropics. And I'm so sorry I'm, I'm to my 
amnesia, I'm forgetting, <laughs> I'm forgetting his, his proper name. But um, yeah, so that's another example of a kind of a skewed investment, which maybe could have been a little bit better uh, shifted and uh, given tropical countries, including Africa, more of a, a chance to contribute and get better data, much better data. For ourselves. Which we could use for ourselves, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it, it, it sounds like an uh, interesting program uh, to, to attend it. But how do you envisage, uh, in terms of how you are going to apply what you learned in the program, uh, in the practical terms? Maybe it relates more to your role as local ambassadors. Uh, perhaps if you just you know, tell us as to what your role in teams is, so that's maybe it's going to you know, answer this question. Yeah, um, I'll can go first. Um, so I know we've created almost like a little bit of an ominous kind of vibe towards the program, but it was there were so many things that we benefited from as well. Um, like more than actually probably what we experienced. I think we were just speaking from, wow, we didn't think it was going to be the way that it actually was. Yeah. But we benefited quite a lot. Um, for example, like learning about different aspects of climate change that we ought to consider when thinking about the environment. Um, and that has just personally for, I think I can speak for the both of us actually, has opened our horizons in terms of how we approach um, the climate space and how we approach environmental matters. and. For me, what I will do going forward um, in terms of trying to contribute to this is definitely focusing a lot more on the social aspects and making sure that people have correct and accurate information to the best of my ability. And I think also just in line with today's talk about climate justice, a big injustice is the fact that not a lot of people have information or information is not communicated to them in a way that they can actually receive information. So I think that the onus is on us as youth ambassadors, people who are highly energetic and have so much energy um, and vigor to be doing things that are more active. It's definitely making sure that the narrative around climate change is communicated effectively, not only to our peers, but to people that don't necessarily have direct access to that information. And for my specific background, like back home, speaking to my siblings about it, speaking to my local community about it, engaging people in different, as, and encouraging people to engage in um, put, what did I, natural sciences. For example, if I go home now, I encourage people to take up natural science as a degree that you want to take. Not only is it just amazing opportunity in terms of jobs or whatever later on, but you also learn so much and it's just so enriching. So I think I'm definitely going to be more vocal about that um, and make sure somehow curate better knowledge that can be received by our peers and um, by dis disadvantaged people. And yeah, yeah, we're going to start a podcast. Yeah, I was going to say, but I don't want to say it. Okay, now we're even talking about like, oh, we can actually start a podcast. We have a lot to say. Um, yeah, we and do. We yeah, chat. we do. We, we do chat, we gab quite we a bit. Podcast, and right. we just find ourselves running in our own frustration, whereas <laughs> all this energy can be actually channeled into making a change in maybe not necessarily the world, but in the way that someone thinks and the way that someone per um, perceives what climate change is and what environmental injustice is and how it impacts them. So and I also, think... And also not to get despondent about all of these yeah. these things, because it's tr it, it, honestly, knowledge is power. Like knowing, like, like Yancy was saying, we did say a lot of negative parts about the program that we were part of, but we know that now. Now we know the context that we're dealing with. Mm. I think in terms of what my role is as a youth ambassador, while we were doing the program, we were encouraged a lot of the time to post on social media <laughs> and share our stories and stuff. And I was like, why are these people trying to get me to to <laughs> advertise their, their, yeah. their thing? And I was kind of um, skeptical about it, but then I realized, oh, this is a global platform that will give me access to places like COP and will give me access to training programs and like other conferences around around the world that will increase my exposure to political discourse and will increase my skills, which like is only so good if I can communicate it and, and pass that knowledge on to the community around me. So I think like there's the aspect of communicating um, what 
climate change is to peers, mm -hmm. but there is also the aspect of like, what information do we need to be checking coming from our own governments? What kind of information um, processes do we need to look at with regards to local municipal mm -hmm. um, engagements? Because that's the way that a lot of our governance, I understand it, occurs mm -hmm. is, is through municipal engagement. Um, and how can I get information to local communities to empower them to be able to say, this is the type of support I need from my government for mm -hmm. climate change um, initiated events. Mm -hmm. So that's, at least now I have that that seed of an idea of what I want to do. Um, and, and the idea or the knowledge that there is a gap for that. Yeah. So that's where and That's also um, in the we had a project that we have to do as sort of like a closing off of the program in which we collaborate with people from other universities so other ambassadors from other universities and initially i personally um, thought the program the project was more of an idea that we have about how we can like contribute to climate to climate change mitigation but the way that it's like panned out it's more of saying that actually go and do this like you guys have the ability and take the initiative to actually go and do all these things that you want to do. And there's different sorts of projects and ideas that all the ambassadors have come up with where they're actually making active contributions in order to mitigate climate change or to solve a certain issue that they might be experiencing. And the fact that they've like, we've got ambassadors from different continents and different countries means that we can target different places. And just being having that access to people and access to the fact that we actually can do things like we don't have to always be so complacent yeah. and be like, oh, I'm just going to put a post on Instagram and that's the most yeah. that we can do. But there's so much support in terms of backing the youth and engaging actively with climate change mitigation. So I think that with that, it just really inspired me to just take a little bit more initiative and even experiencing some of the other ambassadors from Stellenbosch and seeing the stuff that they're actually doing and the, the places and spaces that they're involved in was so encouraging. Like, I really felt like, girl, what are you doing? Like, everyone's got work to do. Everyone's got their thesis to hand in, but they're doing something about it and because they can and they have support to do it. So I think going forward, I definitely want to play a more active role, um, especially engaging with other people as well and being more, taking more initiative. Mm. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay. Um, thank you so much. Maybe that was a good answer. I'm not sure in response to both of you. Uh, but I want to link it now to, to, to Prof. Uh, to say that was also an interesting model that you showed us there. Uh, but I do think that something like that would require proper data management. Mm. So, Given what they were saying, to, to what extent is community involved in generation of climate data? Maybe mm. I'm referring to the school now, as well as the sharing level of uh, do you involve the communities, uh, policy makers? Do you share the data with them thereafter? Um, I think it's repeat the question. <laughs> yes. So, to, to what extent does the climate school share data with, with communities? Uh, well, the, the, the climate school's only been going for about six or seven months. <laughs> so we uh, we're still developing a lot of our um, of our activities, but uh, we will be we are um, including uh, elements of the Center for Invasion Biology into the climate school. There are a lot of intersections between invasion biology and climate. And uh, as part of that um, integration, we run uh, in the Center for Invasion Biology uh, an outreach program called Imbavani, which involves teaching um, schools that are sort of low quintile about invasive species. And that team engages with um, every week with with one of those schools in the in the Western Cape, and they use ants in Bavani, many many ants. Uh, they use ants as an example species, and the students are encouraged to because ants are everywhere. The, uh, at school, they can go and collect ants in the you know in different places in the school, and then they're each given a small microscope. And then they 
look at these ants under a microscope and it's like a light bulb moment you know the, the you suddenly see this this creature this tiny little creature which is so complex and uh, it's just a, a really i think a, a really powerful lesson that uh, there's complexity at very very small scale and things that you think are unimportant actually really really important um so that is that is one outreach program which in fact has been running for uh, enough years now to have encouraged students who were expo exposed to that to come to Stellenbosch University and, and do and do uh, science. Um, but we we're one of the things the school is doing is 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 looking is developing an online uh, African climate perspective. A climate change course, in, an introduction to climate from an African perspective, and then an element on adaptation and adap an element on mitigation. When it comes to collecting data, um, we will obviously partner and are partnering with other faculties like engineering, for example. And if you go and look at the kind of work that is done in engineering, uh, are you aware of? The work that's done in engineering. You're not from engineering, are you? <laughs> so the kind of work that's done in engineering will is mind blowing um, with how they with how they are extracting are, are, are not extracting, but finding solutions to to current issues. So I would mention the work of of Prof uh, Tiens Boysen, in particular, uh, and there are many there are many others. But Tiens Boysen has been working now for, for several years in developing solutions, very practical solutions for energy related issues. He's working in the taxi industry, uh, analyzing, um, using people who actually use the taxi system and tracking you know, what happens to them, uh, engaging with the taxi industry and then uh, putting sensors on taxis and working out how safely they drive, we got a lot of data about uh, driving from from Cape Town to the Eastern Cape and back, and and uh, all these sorts of things, and then trying to find ways of improving safety, improving um, efficiency, and uh, work like that. He's he's done work on um, more efficient classrooms, uh, better lighting systems. He's done work which has shown that uh, African South African classrooms, South African schools are one-tenth as energy dense as a, a typical American school. Uh, so absolutely fascinating on the ground uh, work. So the climate school is, is fostering relationships with you know, across all these faculties and trying to bring all these, uh, all these things together. We do not, uh, as a school, collect you know, weather data. That is done by South African Weather Services and by certain um, you know, commercial commercial services. So that's not a role that we, we're, we're going to follow. We also don't model the climate. So there are two really powerful centers in South Africa that already do that. We don't need to do that. It's WITS and UCT. So we, we're not going to, to do those kinds of things. But we also, through um, groups like the Sustainability Institute and, and, and at EMS, there's a lot of work going on involving um, local communities and uh, trying to improve livelihoods, trying to improve quality of life. And uh, we will we will tap into all of those. So we won't we, we, we don't have to generate that ourselves. We can tap into it, enhance it and try to bring it together with other with other things to synergize and make 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 a bigger picture out of it, get, get some bigger, bigger ideas. So I hope that answers your question, but uh, we, we've got to shortcut it because we don't have a huge amount of money. So we've got to try and leverage what the university already has, which was the whole idea of starting the school, is to synergize what the university already has. Um, mm. I also think mm. that with the journal as well, in terms of disseminating yeah. the knowledge, so the African Journal on Climate Studies is going to be able to allow people from all over Africa to publish the work and the data that they've collected and most of the time it's probably also using local communities to help them collect that data. It's going to be published and it's going to be as open access as possible um, so people will have access to the, the data that they collected and also access to the knowledge that has been generated from um, African academics 
Mm. So I think that's that's gonna it has a huge potential. There's many ways in which you can translate that journal in order to make sure that people do get access to the knowledge and the data that they actually collected or they were involved in or that affects them and is relatable mm. to them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm sure you can talk to <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great. So, that's any, yeah, yeah, yeah it's a complex space, but it's a lot of fun too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you to our speakers. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much to our speakers for a very informative, energetic, vibrant presentation. We really sincerely enjoyed that. So your enthusiasm is a lot of food for thought, not just for the um, audience listening, but um, probably also for the, um, the people up north. Uh, we've got to fight our corner. We have to fight our corner. Hopefully we'll be in the winning, the winning corner at the end of the day. Thank you very much to Professor Mitchley, Mitchley and uh, to you students. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thanks for giving us a talk. For our online audience, thank you very much for this afternoon. Please do not forget about tomorrow's um, program as well. So thank you for attending today. Bye. <laughs>